Hi, my name is Martin Perhiniak. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk about HDR photography. HDR means high dynamic range. And the main reason we use this technique is to shoot in difficult lighting conditions when it's very hard to capture all the highlights and the shadows on images where we have lots of dark details and lots of very bright details at the same time. The three photographs, what you can see on my screen, is a good example of HDR photography. These photos were taken by István Tóth, a Hungarian Adobe expert. And you can see that we have the normal exposure in the middle, and we have an overexposed version on the left and an underexposed version on the right. Obviously, the middle one is the best, but even on the middle one, the shadows are too dark and the highlights are blown out. So that's why we need different exposures and then merge these all together to create the HDR photograph. The technique is called bracketing and mainly you need to change the shutter speed by keeping all the other options on your camera the same, especially the aperture and the focus. If you have a DSLR camera, the best is to shoot in full manual mode and with that only change the shutter speed for each of the photographs. You can do three different exposures or you can do more. In this example, I have five different exposures. And here in Bridge, if I select the first one, on the right in the metadata panel, you can see the shutter speed. So it's 1 60th of a second. If I go to the next one, it's 125. The third one is 250. The th fourth one is 500. And the last one, the most underexposed version is one thousandth of a second. So this is all we need to have a HDR photograph. Also make sure when you do images like these, that you have your camera on a stand and try to do these exposures as fast as possible because there might be changes in the landscape if you take too much time between the exposures. On DSLR cameras, you will probably find an option to automatically create a series of photographs using a bracketing and changing the shutter speed automatically. But it varies on each camera. So that's something that you need to find in the manual for your camera. But even if you don't have a specific option for this, you can do it manually. Just make sure that your camera is on the stand and you don't move it between the exposures. So all the camera itself and the focus and aperture stays the same and only the shutter speed changes. And then if you have all these images, you can select them all from bridge and then go to the tools menu Photoshop and choose Merge to HDR Pro. This action will run in Photoshop and it will open the selected five images and load them into a Photoshop document onto separate layers and then it will run the HDR Pro adjustment. Here you can still see your bracketed images and you can turn on and off each one of them. You can also see the exposure difference between them. And here on the right you have the options to change the look of your HDR photograph. First of all, I would like to zoom a bit closer, so I just switch to 100% view, which is the actual size of the images. And here on the top you can see something that we call ghosts. This is very typical with HDR photographs. In this case, the clouds were moving fast, so between the exposures, the time spent between the exposures caused this effect or this problem that we can easily get rid of if we choose the remove ghosts option here on the top. So that's the first thing that I usually check if I see any ghosting in my HDR photographs. And as you can see, it did a really good job on that one. After that, we have three sections, edge glow, tone and detail, and color. We also have a curve tab here. First of all, we can also change the mode between different bit depths. 
It's better to keep it on 16-bit because there you have more options to control the HDR effect. And also you can choose different ways to work with the HDR photographs. You can use local adaptation or these other three options, but I prefer to work with local adaptation. With this one you can get a realistic effect or a more surrealistic effect, more painterly effect. I'm sure you've seen images like that. So let me just zoom back to see the whole image. And let me play first with the tone and detail options. If I want to see most of the details in the image, I can increase the detail value. And as I said, this will make the image a bit more painterly or surrealistic, something that you won't see in real life. But it gives a very interesting effect to the whole image. Obviously, you can always balance this out, so you don't need to increase it too much. Just keep it somewhere in the middle in this case. You can increase the exposure if you want to make the image a bit brighter, and also you can use Gamma. The Gamma is more like the Shadow Highlights option in Photoshop, so if you start to increase it, it will darken the highlights and brighten the shadows. If I decrease it, it will do the opposite. So Gamma is something that you can add also to see more details in the image. And then we also have the shadow highlight options, which is again similar to the same uh, option in Photoshop. So you can also add even more to that if you want to. But be careful because you are losing contrast by adding more gamma or changing the shadow and highlight options. But you can always compensate the contrast with the detail option. If you want to pump up the colors, you can also use vibrance and saturation to add even more colors to your image. And if you are not happy with the results, you can also even use the curve where you can again, moving up the curve, you can increase the brightness, moving it down, you can decrease the brightness and you can create S curves to increase the contrast like this one. If you want to change it back to the original curve, you can click on reset curve. The edge glow options are mainly affecting the edges and I usually work with these at the end. If I want to keep the edges crisp and sharp, I keep the radius close to zero pixels. But if I want to have a more dreamy effect on the image, I increase the radius up and then I will have this soft oil painting effect. And you can go crazy with this, you can increase the radius even more and then you will increase this effect even more. And if you want to keep this dreamy effect, but at the same time you want to have even more contrast, you can also use strength. So if you increase the strength as well, you can see the difference of the image. It will have stronger shadows and stronger highlights. So once again, I show you before, so with less strength, looks like this. And with more strength, it will increase highlights and shadows. So the extremes, it makes it more dramatic. So these are the main options that you need to work with. And if you want to, you can save these options as a preset. So when you next time come back and you want to use the same settings on another HDR uh, photograph, you can always choose it uh, from the preset options here on the top. So to be able to save it, you need to click on this little preset options icon here and choose save preset. And then you can save it as an HDT file. Let me just call this mountains. And next time, if I need it, I can always select it from the preset option. By the way, we have lots of presets here. These are all default presets, which you can also choose. For example, I use surrealistic low contrast. And then I get this effect. And if I want to go back to my saved options, I just choose mountains. OK, once you are ready, you can click on OK to apply these changes. And there you have it. We created an HDR image from multiple exposures. Now, in Photoshop CS5, we also have an option under the image menu 
we find adjustments HDR toning. Now this is a very interesting option because with this you can even simulate HDR with one exposure. So you don't even need to have multiple exposures. If you only have an image that you think can work well with HDR effects, then you can use this adjustment. So let me show you this. I close this example or I just go back to bridge and I open up this image. Just simply double clicking on it will open up in Photoshop. So let's just try image adjustments HDR toning. Here I can see uh, the same options that we had for the multiple exposures. It's exactly the same thing. It also uses the same method, local adaptation. And we can even choose the same presets from here. So there you can see mountains. But in this case, I'm going to select castle because that's the option that I wanted to use with this image. I don't want to go through all these options again. And if you click on preview or press P, you can see before. And again, I press P to see after. So it's a huge change. Let me click on OK to accept the change. So once again, if I undo the step, this was before and this is after. As you can see, even from one photograph, you can create amazing HDR like effect. But there is only one problem with this option that it is destructive. I'm going to show you a way to use the HDR toning non-destructively. Unfortunately, we can't even use smart objects because the HDR toning will always flatten all your layers and then apply your changes. So I already applied my effect, but I have in my history panel the original image. So if I click on this one, that's the original image and this is the HDR image. So what I can do is that I can create a new layer, an empty layer and having the history brush set to the original image. So the first state of the image here in the history panel, this is how you can change the history brush state. So I keep it on the original image and I have that new layer selected and then I go to edit and I choose fill and from the use options I choose history and I keep the opacity on 100%. Then if I click on OK, Photoshop will fill the new layer with the original image. So now I have the original image, I can even call this layer original and I have on the other layer the HDR effect and if I change the order of the two layers, so I move HDR on the top. By the way, you can only move a background layer if you first turn it into a normal layer. The easiest way is to just double click on it and rename it. So when you change the order of the two, now you can control the opacity. So if I click on opacity and drag it down, I can fade the effect of the HDR and start to see the original image in the background. So that's a very clever way to be able to control the amount of the effect even after you applied it. So now I keep it somewhere around 60%. So if I turn off the HDR, this is before and this is after. Still looks really good, but not too strong. I think with 100% it was too strong. So let's see again with full screen, without HDR and with HDR. And this is all you need to know about HDR toning and HDR Pro options in Photoshop. And now it's time for you to play with your images and try these great features. Thanks for your attention and see you in the next tutorial.